Thank you. <clears throat> Just sending off my text answer. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it was an awesome talk, Mary. I enjoyed that. And I also enjoyed the Prezi. And I'm embarrassed to say that this is just a boring old PowerPoint. So I don't know how many of you are still asking the question, why in the world am I even talking about <clears throat> opening up a new pediatric bariatric program? I think my job is to, to move more people towards that, and we'll see how that goes in the next 10 or 15 minutes. I have no disclosures. But let me begin to, cr to try to um, explain to you why one would want to do this. And you'll see data like this probably throughout the morning. Um, but the important point here is that if you look, and this is over the last uh, 12 years, you can see that the prevalence of severe obesity is still going up in children. There were reports at the end of 2010 that maybe we were leveling things off. That does not seem to be happening so far. So we can stick our heads in the sand and say that the problem no longer exists, but that's not really the case. And if you take the BMI 35 and above, which we, we have and just published this week. Um, that means 6% of all children in the United States are severely obese with a BMI of 35 or above, and 2% above 40. And if you do the math quickly, that, that's upwards of 4.5 million children ages 0 to 19. If you take the 10-year cutoff, just for argument's sake, that's 2.25 million children. Or if you take the 13-year cutoff, that's still 2 million children in the United States that could potentially be candidates for bariatric surgery. We don't see very many kids with a BMI above 35 that don't have some comorbidity. That's, that's pretty uncommon. So again, how many people are currently doing adolescent weight loss surgery? Uh, yeah, we're going to be busy. There are not many. We're going to be really busy taking care of 2 million people. And that's the reason to talk about what to do to open up some new programs. This map was generously provided by Dr. Pratt and her resident, Nuna Perez, who I think is presenting the same thing right now over at IPEG. And it is just an illustration of how many surgeons who will take adolescents and children in their practice per million obese individuals in the United States. Um, I, as one surgeon, make Delaware orange. So it gives you an idea. There really aren't there that many out there. And there are a lot of states where the obesity burden is quite high, where the number is close to zero. And that, again, is something that we're trying to address because that's really one of the main barriers to access for treatment for this patient population. There are plenty of others. Um, insurance payers are still making their way towards approval. Um, I think pediatricians still have some, some, um, mis you know, some misgivings about this. But there is going to be an academy-based statement, I think, by the end of the year that I hope will move the pediatricians uh, farther towards this. But I think one of the big barriers right now is there aren't that many places, particularly in some parts of the country, that will perform this surgery. Close to 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to be involved in a uh, focus group um, sponsored by the Children's Hospital Association. So it was a group of about 16 of uh, really the top weight management programs at that time in the country for children. Multidisciplinary, there were only two surgeons, myself and Mark Mikowski. We weren't even sure why we were invited. Um, because it really was to talk about the problem of childhood obesity. But what became apparent very quickly in the first hour or two of the focus group was that the issue of bariatric surgery and the need to provide it was one of the most important points to this group of multidisciplinary providers. So there were pediatricians, there were psychologists, there were dietitians, um, and again, only two surgeons. So we really didn't drive this conversation. But over the next two or three focus groups in that 18-month period, our goal was to provide a framework for what a, the ideal weight management bariatric program would look like for pediatricians and the kind of program that a pediatrician could support. And so the next few slides kind of go through that with you. And again, this is the ideal. It's not designed to create yet another barrier, but it's an idea of what really you need to think about before you start a program. And that was published uh, in the journal Pediatrics in 2011, and still, I think, sits as one of, the, one of the main publications that addresses this issue. The members of this focus group were from all kinds of different practice models. There were freestanding children's hospitals with inpatient programs. There were private practices with outpatient programs. There were programs in hospitals within hospitals. So we clearly knew that there were going to be several different models for this. The first is a freestanding children's hospital or weight management program with a pediatric surgeon. How many 
pediatric surgeons are in the audience that are doing weight loss surgery. So again, we're going to be pretty busy. There are 800 practicing pediatric surgeons in the country. Maybe 5% have a real interest in bariatric surgery. Probably not much more than that, so about 40 or 50. <coughs> so that's not going to be the predominant model, and we realize that. Another model would be a freestanding children's hospital or program that collaborates with an adult bariatric surgeon. And that seems like a pretty um, reasonable model. And it, and it gets rid of some of the problems with having pediatric resources available at an adult center. And the third one, which is probably going to be the most common one, is an adult program that develops pediatric expertise and does these surgeries in the context of an adult bariatric surgery program. So the first thing that was critical for us is that no matter what the program was, they need to demonstrate institutional commitment to this program. It, it's not cheap, and as Mary said, you're not getting paid for a lot of this stuff, particularly with Medicaid and children. It's not, not great payment. That commitment is, is, um, is identified with uh, ongoing training, training from understanding what the complications are to understanding how to deal with these families to understanding how to move a 400-pound patient without hurting your back. There are all kinds of things that particularly pediatric programs don't really deal with uh, and ongoing training for that. You know, the culture is going to be critical. Historically, children's hospitals don't deal with a lot of morbidly obese kids, although that's changing. Um, and certainly in, in adult programs, trying to deal with parents is, is a whole different issue uh, that needs to be focused on. Subspecialty support, um, I think, sometimes is an issue in adult hospitals. You want age-specific pediatric. You don't want to ask an adult cardiologist to deal with a 10-year-old with, with myocardial um, hypertrophy. The patient medical home was something that, that we spent a lot of time on. Um, pediatricians are really protective of their patients. And children's hospitals have learned that and have developed ways to really collaborate well with the primary care pediatricians in their region. So adult hospitals would have to figure out how to do that without having the pediatricians feel like the patients are being taken away from them. And finally, equipment, instruments, and facilities. Again, most children's hospitals now do deal with morbidly obese adolescents. But if you're starting a bariatric program, you better make darn sure that you've got the equipment in the OR that will deal with it. You've got diagnostic equipment that will help you if you need to get a CAT scan. Um, that you have the kind of equipment you need to move these patients safely after surgery. You have equipment in your waiting rooms for a clinic. You have equipment um, in the inpatient wards that will, that will manage these people and their families who also tend to be uh, morbidly obese as well. The governance structure, this, this was kind of new at that time. Um, at that point, most adult centers were run by a surgeon. And if there was a medical doctor involved, uh, they certainly weren't part of the, the leadership of those programs. And we identified the need to have co-leadership between a surgeon and a pediatrician or somebody interested in adolescent medicine. Uh, the bariatric coordinator was more of a nurse or a, a, an extender who really was sort of the day-to-day -day overseer of the children going through the program and also hopefully did a lot with, with research and data collection. The, da the patient oversight committee, everyone has one, but again, this needed to be really involving the, the medical group as well as the surgeon. So when we meet to talk about every patient, we have the pediatricians there, we have the subspecialists, the behavioral health docs, um, the, di the dietitian, and everybody need to be there. And a lot of the adult programs um, have different versions of that, I would say. And then quality and safety oversight, uh, not just a surgical m and but really um, have a, an ongoing conversation about exactly what Dr. Brandt just discussed. What are the, what are the risks? And what, what, are the, what are the complications that we're providing to these patients even before we, uh, they discharge from the hospital? Personnel. This is not going to be cheap either. A lot of this is not reimbursable. But this group, the focus group, really believed that these were important components to the program. Obviously, you have to have a surgeon. We've talked about that. The pediatrician subspecialists, either a board-certified pediatrician or pediatric subspecialist, or an internist or family practice doc who has special interest in training in adolescents. Uh, the nurse extender or the nurse that we've talked about, this actually uh, is one of the few that has made the more recent accreditation guidelines, and we'll get to those in a minute. Um, but you really have to have a psychologist that's more than just available on the other side of town. They really need to be part of the program. In our, in our own program, our psychologist sees almost every patient every time they come in. And I assure you, if I walk in the room and see tears, the psychologist is coming in. Uh, registered dietitian, there are um, pediatric um, 
certification programs, and we highly recommend that. You know, these kids got where they were with eating patterns that started when they were toddlers or even before. And so the, these dietitians need to teach the children how to eat. They need to teach them about nutrition in age-appropriate terms. Exercise physiologists, we have a physiologist. You could have a physical therapist. Um, she's a critical part of our program. I mean, these kids probably have never engaged in sports. They probably never went to gym class. And they quite literally need to be taught how to play. You can't just tell them to go to a gym and get on the treadmill with a bunch of 55-year-olds. And they're just not going to do that. So you got to engage them in stuff they like to do. And in fact, our exercise physiologist runs classes most every night of the week. And that's a big part of our support group post-op. And the kids enjoy coming. They look forward to it. Social work, honestly, we don't have a full-time one. But these families, again, have a lot of problems that need to be dealt with before we can move forward with surgery. And who doesn't need a business manager, right? So the recommended components, this isn't too different from adult programs. Um, certainly, it's important to have clinical pathways to talk about pre-op screening, preparation, perioperative care, and the long-term follow-up. We talked about primary care integration. And again, this is really important to pediatricians. They want to be ongoing partners in this. Um, the next two are, are, are kind of a challenge for, for freestanding children's programs. My own hospital won't allow me to see patients over the age of 21. So we have to have a transition plan in place for these kids who will probably transition you know, three to five years after surgery. They might go off to college. So we've, we've developed relationships with, with college health care centers. Um, but this is really, I think, important for pediatric programs that are freestanding. Support groups are required for adult and pediatric programs. And uh, Dr. Brandt talked about the, the vital importance and, in fact, our responsibility to collect and share data, which uh, we firmly endorsed in this program. So in the last couple of minutes, let me talk a little bit about the accreditation piece. So back in 2010, the College of Surgeons and ASMBS kind of were on their own separate ways. They had their own credentialing processes for adult programs, and they really didn't deal with adolescents much because it really wasn't an issue for them at that point. Right around the time that the, uh, the focus for a fitter future came out, leadership from the college and from ASMBS began to collaborate and to develop the, what's currently known as MBS AQIP, or the Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Accreditation and Quality Improvement Project. And I'm sure most people here are familiar with that. And in 2014, the first guidelines came out. They were updated in 2016. And in fact, I just saw the group downstairs as they're working on volume three, which will hopefully come out next year. The great part about this is that a few of us were able to collaborate with them and develop what's known as Standard 9, which is the first time that standards for an adolescent program were actually published for an accreditation. These are the mandated components for Standard 9. They look a lot different than what we talked about before. The big sticking point, I think, for a freestanding adolescent program is volume. Um, most of you probably know that in an adult program, you have to have a volume of at least 50 stapled cases a year. That volume number was dropped to 25 in recognition that our volumes are much lower. In fact, we're finding that most of the freestanding centers are having a hard time even reaching that 25 volume, even though the complication rate is, is very similar to the, to the higher volume adult programs. And so I think in volume three, in version three, you'll see volume numbers drop even lower with the critical uh, piece that all data will be presented and reviewed every six months. So if problems crop up, we'll find them fairly quickly. Pediatric medical director, again, this was huge. Before that, Neither of the larger adult programs required a medical doctor to be part of the leadership of the program. And finally, they, everybody agreed that the importance of an adolescent behavioral health component to be actually part of the program rather than a 30-minute you know, appointment at the very beginning of the process. We weren't able to push them to put a dietitian and an exercise person in, but I still wholeheartedly believe that they are critical parts of a program. So right now, and this comes probably at least three weeks old now, so I don't know if new ones have come up, but this comes from Mark Mikowski, and I'm going to thank him. Uh, there are 75 comprehensive centers, meaning an adult center with additional adolescent designation. There are also six currently freestanding adolescent centers with a combination of models in there, uh, some with freestanding children's hospitals with adult surgeons, some with pediatric surgeons, and some hospital within hospitals. Not all of these centers, I think, are going to be able to maintain the volume requirement for redesignation. So it is rather important that we revisit that. And again, the ASMBS is working on that right now. So if we look at the volume from these centers in the first two years, the adult volume, 150, 160,000 cases. 
pediatric volume was much lower, about a tenth of 1% of the adult cases. After version two came out, the 2016 numbers looked pretty similar. And 2017 numbers are looking the same way, although they're not going to be formally released until the end of, of uh, June. Bottom line, up to the end of 2016, 600 cases had been performed in children. That was about 0.1% of all bariatric cases performed at these centers. But more importantly, that was less than 10 cases per center. You take 81 centers and divide by 600, and you get about 7.5. So these centers, even though they're accredited to do adolescent surgery, they're really not putting through the volume that we need to deal with that two to three million children that are still out there. No, I want to go that way, sorry. So let me just finish by talking about what are the challenges for the in different kinds of models. So for the children's hospitals or the freestanding centers, again, volume is going to be an issue. You know, a pediatric surgeon is not going to be able to do 25, 30 cases a year, at least currently, in part because of payer reluctance, pediatrician reluctance, and yet pediatric surgeons do a lot of really advanced laparoscopic foregut surgery and do it very safely. Surgeon expertise and interest. Again, not too many pediatric surgeons, I think, are going to raise their hands and volunteer for this. Um, so a challenge is to collaborate potentially with a, a local adult bariatric surgeon um, who's willing to come and participate fully in the program. Uh, equipment is an issue, I think, for children's hospitals. Um, I know uh, when we built our new hospital, we put in a lot of bariatric equipment that would not have been considered if we weren't doing bariatric surgery. And then long-term follow-up is something that children's programs really need to deal with. On the adult side, access to pediatric resources. You know, most, most adult programs don't have ready pediatric subspecialists, pediatric psychologists, what have you. Uh, and those don't come for free. They might be cheap, but they're not free, and they certainly aren't going to be reimbursed. Uh, and a relationship with a medical home, I can't overstate the importance of having a good relationship with the community pediatricians, or, the, or they're not going to refer their, sorry, they're not going to refer their patients to you. It's really important. And then expertise in the hospital to care for these younger patients and their families. Uh, a lot of our local adult hospitals won't even do appendectomies in kids under 18. Um, so really it's a cultural change for some of these places to begin to talk about doing major surgery on 12-year-olds and dealing with families and complications and what have you. So with that, I'll close, and we'll take, I guess, all comments and questions after. Yep. All right. Thank you, Kurt. That was great. Great summary. Another question. Uh,